All right, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another uh, edition of Live with the League here on Monday at noon. Uh, we meet to do this conversation every other Monday. Uh, today, I'm uh, very happy to be joined by um, our Lansing team again. We got Chris Hackbarth, our Director of State and Federal Affairs, Harrisana Richards, one of our legislative associates. Uh, Jennifer Richtering will be joining us shortly, another legislative associate. Uh, she has another meeting, but she's going to come on and talk about short term rentals. And then John Lamaki is off today. Uh, I think he's hunting or doing something outdoorsy with the hunting season started. <laughs> so we'll just uh, jump into it and uh, welcome everybody. Chris, how are you doing today? Great. Other than the uh... The snowstorm I got to drive through this weekend, it's wonderful. Oh, no. Michigan. <laughs> That's right, Michigan in November. You never know what you're gonna get. It was 60s one day and then we had snow flurries the next. So um, just wanted to cover an array of topics. Uh, the first one um, I wanna talk with you, Chris, about um, is the, the infrastructure package that was passed on the federal level. And I just kind of hope you can kind of break that down for us and, yeah. and what it means for our for our, our communities, uh, and particularly you know as they're looking at their budgets and, and trying to figure out what to do moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, obviously it continues to be a busy time in D.C. Um, it's been uh, seems like a breakneck pace the last two years between Lansing and, and Washington. Uh, but uh, as we posted a, a few days ago, uh, following the the House's passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, there is a blog on our Inside 208 webpage that gives a breakdown here. I don't know, Betsy, if you can post that in chat as well uh, for everybody. But uh, you know, the, the president's expected today to sign uh, the Infrastructure Act. It's a total of about $1.2 $1 to $1.3 trillion. That includes a reauthorization of the transportation, uh, transportation reauthorization, transportation funding. So about 550 billion of that 1.2 plus trillion is brand new. Uh, that will be spread over the next five years. Uh, so I know when we looked at uh, you know some of the the conversations around the federal highway spending and um, bridge spending, you know those those topics that were just discussed our major major focal points of the bill spread over the next uh, you know five years Michigan stands to get just under eight billion dollars total uh, under that transportation reauthorization so about uh, two and a half billion of that will be new spread over the five years so about 470 million a year in new road and bridge funding uh, federal aid eligible roads uh, spending will be will be coming out. Uh, the feds have have these dollars flowing out through the existing programs, existing federal aid eligible programs. So your National Highway Performance Program, Surface Transportation Block Grants, Highway Safety Improvement, uh, Railway Highway Crossings, Metropolitan Planning, National Freight Program, things like that. Those will be all the, the specific categories that MDOT will work through their normal formulas. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, a ton of conversations with the legislature about how they're going to kind of uh, play a little three card Monty with those dollars and, and see how much we can get to uh, out to local units. Um, certainly, this gives a lot of uh, a lot of boost to the current bu state budget that has uh, local bridge replacement. I imagine we'll have a much bigger conversation about local bridge replacement than the hundred that they've got designated in the current budget. Now, Chris, did I hear you say that this is, um, is, is this a repeating allocation or is it one time money like the ARP funding is? So, so the federal highway, federal highway funding is always set up as a, as a reauthorization. It's usually set up in, in five year cycles and, and John's not here, but he could speak to that. The current FAST Act, F-A-S-T, is the, the, the reauthorization that was just done. So those dollars, again, Michigan for the prior five year period, got about just under 5.6 billion in FAST. Um, the, the new funding is 7.9 billion for the, for the transportation authorization that Michigan will get. That is spread over a five-year period. So the dollars okay. from, this, uh, from this Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will be spread over the next five years. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, you know, beyond sort of the federal highway funding, uh, road and bridge funding, we have uh, you know, money for the power grid. Uh, they've got $65 billion uh, nationally for the power grid, broadband, water infrastructure, cybersecurity, 
public transit, airports, the environment ports. Um, you know, so those things, uh, electric vehicle charging stations, when we're talking about at the Michigan level, uh, we're looking at uh, about a billion dollars additional in public transit funding, um, 1.3 billion for water infrastructure, 110 million for expansion of uh, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, another hundred million dollars for broadband expansion and coverage, uh, 23 million related to wildfire prevention, 24 million for cybersecurity, and 360 million for airport infrastructure investments. So, like I said, there's a lot of a lot of uh, new funding coming when you get beyond sort of the the federal highway, uh, and even that has new funding. But like I said, those right. big amounts. And what should can how should communities view this? It's like a lot of money coming. It's all probably going right to the state. I assume should they be doing you know road repairs and stuff, knowing that maybe this money's coming and they should wait on that, or how should they be looking at this this funding? So a lot of TBD here, Matt. Obviously, the president has he's signing it today. Um, some of the information we were getting last week from our congressional delegation was that these dollars probably aren't going to start flowing until April. As we've seen with American Rescue Plan, for our members who are watching, there are some of them are obviously still waiting for their money from Michigan Treasury, uh, and right. we're still waiting for the final guidance from U.S. Treasury. Uh, and we don't know when that final guidance will get here yet. My guess is it's going to be a few months of, of waiting while, while the feds kind of let the dust settle and get things sorted out. The impression we do get though is to the extent possible, these federal dollars will be flowing through existing programs. So existing federal programs like the state revolving fund, uh, you know, other, other federal programs for moving the dollars uh, out uh, to the states. They will go through the states for the most part. Most of these funds will, will go to Michigan. Michigan will either receive them directly as part of a formula or will have to apply for these grants. Uh, so like I said, some of this is some of this is going to be dependent on Michigan competing and winning some of these grants. So we don't know necessarily, certainly on the road and bridge side of things, working through their metropolitan planning uh, organizations. Working through your your rural uh, your, your rural planning organization for how the normal federal allocation process occurs. That's going to be where folks are going to be kind of lining up and and working within those statewide regional entities to divide the dollars up. But again, beyond that, we're going to have a whole big conversation, just as we are with American Rescue Plan, of how the state is going to allocate the dollars that come down depending upon the guidance the feds give us. Okay, so, and we'll, we'll talk to Harris on more in a bit about on that. Just So we did get a couple of questions, Chris, specific to what you're talking about. Um, first question is, am I correct that the local bridge replacement does not include private bridges in our community, but only public bridges? So I don't wanna to speak too far out of school. Again, this is, John's been managing this for us, but my understanding is yes, it would be public bridges would be what is covered under the local bridge replacement program in the current budget. And okay. MDOT has already identified, and I believe, Matt, you put a list, uh, updated a list into one of our blogs we did on this a few weeks ago, month ago. Um, I think we have a link. I think we have a link in a blog. So we'll, we can find it and add it to the chat uh, okay. from the budget blog that was done. Uh, there is a link to the, the bridges that MDOT has already identified based upon the criteria laid out. Okay, and a next kind of question on the same topic is, how do we find out information on the electrical vehicle charging stations, the money you talked about, do we need to apply for those funding? And I guess that's a larger question, is there a lot of these pockets that will be, will be competitive base where you have to apply for some of these other pockets of money? Well, as I mentioned, until, until we know how the Fed programs are gonna be set up and will they be allocating to Michigan directly or uh, or will Michigan have to compete for the grants? Then the next step down is, okay, once Michigan either gets the dollars or uh, competes in, and is awarded dollars, how will the legislature set up the appropriation process for locals to access it? Again, we don't know the answer to that just yet. That's okay. still coming, but I would expect we'll know more by the end of the year here. And again, as the dust settles after the president signs the bill today. But again, it isn't even signed yet. He's signing yeah. it today. Right. So an, uh, another one kind of related questions for many of these new funds, new in, in quotes, will they be funneled through existing state or federal programs or alternative, alternatively, will they um, 
basically be uh, separate programs that will be newly created. Again, the, the impression we received from uh, talking with our partners at National League of Cities and our congressional delegation is that to the extent possible, they are going to utilize existing federal programs, existing avenues to get these dollars out. Um, does that mean all of it? No, there will probably be something new that, that is created, or they'll have a new component of an existing program. But until we get uh, some more detail, uh, you know, we don't know the answer to that. National League of Cities, for, for our members who are watching who are who are members of NLC, uh, they have a great insight tool that's available uh, for members. You can actually go through and look uh, line by line, program by program, how the dollars were divvied up at the federal level. Uh, and then and then you can see kind of who who qualifies for the funds. Are the funds going to the state? Are they competitively bid? Is it a formula? What agency is responsible for it? So there's some good detail again from a little bit of a of a of a federal level to see where these different programs are lining out. And that's something that's available to NLC members. Okay. Uh, good question here. Is there any difference for entitlement versus non-entitlement communities? I'm, I'm assuming they're talking specific to the infrastructure money, because we know with ARP, there was a clear uh, delineation between non-entitlement and entitlement communities as far as what they were getting. Is there any kind of breakdown like that for these? For we, we don't have any breakdown on that yet. No. Again, okay. federal, our understanding is federal highway dollars, the road and bridge dollars will flow according to the existing uh, formulas. Uh, but once we get into some of the other like broadband and water infrastructure, uh, they've got PFAS and lead and copper, you know, those things we'll have to wait to see what uh, the federal bill was 2700 pages long. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> did anybody read that at, during a filibuster like they did the other? <laughs> I have not read this one yet. All right. Some good uh, sleeping material, probably. <laughs> Right. So, okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, anything else you want to dive in on the infrastructure package or do you want to go on to the next topic? No, I think, I mean, you know, just again, as we, you know, there's still conversations taking place on uh, what's called reconciliation, the build back better plan. Uh, you know, I think the, you know, the administration had a separate proposal on uh, other, other national investments beyond infrastructure, uh, beyond kind of the hard infrastructure, those discussions are still go ongoing. Uh, yeah. We heard today that there's, you know, the potential that uh, prior to Thanksgiving, uh, we could see a, a House vote. And I think that's, you know, that's the next step and, and you know, potentially the third leg of the stool here uh, for spending that, that could be taking place from the federal level. But uh, that may also be what's keeping U.S. Treasury from finalizing their, their ARP guidance is they're waiting on these, these other pieces to, to be laid out. Uh, okay. But we don't know what that, you know, there's been a lot of moving parts with that piece, much different than the infrastructure. Infrastructure pretty much was, was as the Senate had passed it back in August. Uh, but this, this, uh, this other Build Back Better plan is definitely much more fluid as they work to negotiate. And that's something that, again, we could see more, more information on in the next couple of weeks. Okay, I do want to dive into the American Rescue Plan, ARP, uh, or ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, got a couple questions from Joe uh, Young on that. One is, uh, where are the ARPA rules on using funds for park? What are the probably is what it is. What are the ARPA rules on using funds for parks and recreation? Um, that might be a question for our Serve My City program, but um, correct. Yeah, I know Shanna and, and Tim Dempsey, Shanna Drayheim from our team and Tim Dempsey, who's been working with our Serve My City program, have done a great job. Um, Betsy, if you could throw a link in the chat for that as well, uh, please. The, you know, there have been folks who have been asking that question specifically around parks. You know, I, you know there's a lot of guidance, a lot of uh, kind of FAQ that uh, U.S. Treasury has put out as part of their interim guidance. It's obviously not final yet, uh, but there is some guidance. I know the Serve My City program staff have been helping with those specific questions on eligibility kind of across the spectrum. So definitely get a hold of, of our Serve My City team and they can help with that. Yep, and I believe this, the email for that is servemycity at mml.org and serve my is from Michigan, MI in the middle. And we can put the link to that email address in there as well. Another question from Joe, uh, will the new census numbers impact the state shared revenues? Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is an issue that has, uh, we've been, been tracking pretty closely the last few weeks. Obviously, uh, everyone knows Michigan grew overall by two and a half percent, but that there were some wide variations across the state in terms of, of what individual communities census numbers looked like. Uh, certainly for constitutional revenue sharing, 
uh, your census numbers help determine your per capita allocation under constitutional revenue sharing. Because Michigan received, because every, every state received their numbers so late from the Census Bureau back in September of this year, uh, and the adjustments that uh, the state of Michigan needs to make to those, U.S. Census uh, gives at the township and city level, they don't necessarily do the village level. So at Michigan, the state demographer actually does all those adjustments and, and you know, pulls out the different census tracts from the townships to put into villages, as well as making adjustments for institutional populations. That hasn't been finalized yet. Those adjustments, we were told from the uh, Treasury Department, Michigan Treasury, that that probably won't take place until February of next year. So you will be seeing adjustments based upon your increase or decrease in population starting in February of next year. And keep in mind that you are eligible for those adjust, uh, eligible or liable for those adjusted numbers back to October of 2020. So any community that grew uh, should see, in, in addition to their adjustment, also an additional adjustment to make up for being underpaid. And any community that shrunk in population should expect a further downward adjustment uh, to reflect the overpayment they received for the last year. This is something we are working on uh, very closely with members of the legislature. I just had a meeting this morning on that uh, topic uh, with appropriation staff and talking with the administration about that, trying to find a way potentially to hold communities harmless for any of that clawback uh, that would take place. So what, 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 which payment do you think they'll notice a difference? Like I know that payments come. Payments come bi-monthly. Uh, Treasury will likely smooth it uh, over the course of the, the remaining payments of this fiscal year. So, oh, so, you know, so February, uh, April, June. Okay. All right. I do. Um, I know uh, Jen Jennifer Rink Trink is, is doing double duty with two meetings at one time. So she has joined us. I want to switch gears real quick and talk about the ever important short term rental issue, uh, Chris, and then we'll get back to you and talk more about ARP. And we'll want to talk about the legislative schedule. And then Harrisana, we want to talk to you about our AR ARP coalition work. So, Jen, if you could uh, hop on, and I think she's on here. I thought I saw a note from her. So there she is. I'm here. Okay, so so go ahead and tell us the latest on short-term rental issue. We thought there might be a vote uh, last week in the Senate. That didn't happen, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Uh, go ahead and talk us what, what's the latest and how can our members help? Sure, Matt. Well, first of all, I would just like to say thank you to everyone who engaged again on this issue, um, reached out to their senator, reached out to the governor's office, um, and is trying to help those um, who don't understand for some reason the impact that this has on neighborhoods and quality of life. We all know from the local government perspective, it's you know a full frontal attack on home rule and, and local control. Um, but when we dial that down to the neighborhood level and the impact that House Bill 4722 can have on our neighborhoods in communities that are destination places, as well as really any community where someone wants to have uh, a reoccurring lease of not more than 30 days to try to get around um, you know, commercial requirements in residential areas, that really can impact anywhere, as well as local rental inspection programs, since it says you can't treat a dwelling any differently. Um, there, there's an impact statewide. So first and foremost, I would just like to say thank you to everyone. Um, as Matt mentioned, there was no uh, vote last week in the Senate um, and uh, many people reaching out and voicing their opposition um, is, is, is the reason that happened. So, you know, we had, a, we had some success last week, but this is not over. Um, as you're going to talk about here in a little bit, um, legislature is on break and now until November 30th. Um, we're expecting that um, Senator Horn is going to be having a hearing on his bill, uh, Senate Bill 547, which is uh, a non-zoning bill. It is setting up a registry. It deals with some of the tax parity issues. And then it refers to zoning saying that a community cannot have a ordinance or regulation or rule that has the effect of prohibiting uh, short-term rentals. So we know or we anticipate that that bill is gonna at least have a hearing um, before 4722 is on the floor for a vote. Um, but it's also been quite clear that if the Senate has the votes, uh, they'll run that bill. 
And so that's why we need folks talking to their legislators, their senators in particular, and making sure they understand what 30% of your housing stock being short-term rentals, what does that actually look like? How many units does that compute to? What kind of impact does that have on your most desirable neighborhoods? Because there's no way um, through the way the bill is written to allow you to spread that 30% out across your community. Um, so think about investors and corporations coming in and buying up um, in your most desirable uh, places. They're really the way um, a lot of times they're paying cash. Um, they can forego that final inspection. So they're gonna be able to close on a deal uh, way quicker than your average homeowner that's looking to buy a residential property going through traditional uh, ways of financing, having to do the inspections, not being able to close, you know, all cash in, in, in a few, you know, weeks, if right. not less. Um, so that's, you know, that's where we're at. And um, we are hoping that our members are getting their schools involved um, and talking about the impact this could have, um, you know, you need places for families to live, to pop, for students to populate your school district, um, your uh, local and regional affordable housing um, advocates, because this will have a huge impact on an already um, affordable housing crisis that we have going on across the state when you have unfettered short-term vacation rentals. Right. Um, so really talking about that you know, quality of life aspect and what this means to, to the average resident who lives next door or across the street from one of these short-term rentals that, that's having issues. Right. Now, you mentioned a really good point early on about that 30% number. What does that look like in your community? There was an article in the Holland Sentinel where they went to ask the city of Holland, how many houses do you have and how many would you have to allow under this? And they had like 11,000 plus houses that turned out to be about 3,000 or in change of short-term rentals potentially in their community. I currently think they, they allow 25 under their regulations. So that's a huge difference with 30% of your community turning into many hotels that could have a dramatic impact. And, and those don't necessarily spread all evenly over the community. You could be a house in the donut hole and you could have short-term rentals all around you, depending on where you live, if you're on a lake or whatever. So it really has a huge impact. So if you, anybody listening today has those numbers, feel free to email them to me because we're going to be putting some together some materials. If you could show us what your housing stock is and what 30% would mean for your community. And if you want to shoot me a line about, you know, how you feel about that, what 30% would do to your community, I would really appreciate it. Like I said, I will post um, my email in the chat in the chat so you could send those to me, but it will be a very big help to us. So Jen, anything else on this issue? Uh, I know a lot going on, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely while uh, the legislature is on break, if you have the opportunity to attend a coffee hour or an office hour with your Senator or even your representative um, and, and one, uh, talk to them about this issue, uh, your rep, depending on how they voted, make sure they understand uh, the consequence of that yes vote or thank them for being a no vote. Um, and again, your senator, they need to understand, you need to remind them of what's going on in the district um, and, and not that everything is the same in Lansing as it is where you live and they're from. Um, and really just, you need to show them and talk to them about this impact. Um, and if you have a local rental inspection program, um, are you going to start inspecting owner-occupied dwellings? Because if you're not, then you cannot inspect short-term rentals, um, which again is defined as a rental of 30 consecutive days or less. And anybody can amend or change a lease to be to fit that and be a short-term rental. And they are not a commercial um, a commercial use. The other big uh, thing, if you read the very first section of 4722 and 446, Senate Bill 446, that section 206B, it strictly states in there, for the purposes of zoning, the following applies, including, but not limited to short-term rentals. So the other thing um, I've been working with the Bed and Breakfast Association, what Bed and Breakfast Association, what Bed and Breakfast entity is gonna go through the hoops um, and, and regulations of having to get licensed and do all the things they have to do to legally be a bed and breakfast when technically they fit the definition of a short-term rental. 
And so going forward, um, they'll just declare their short-term rentals um, and, and they won't be bed and breakfast anymore because they won't have to, again, do all the, the rules and regulations that bed and breakfast are required to do. And because it uh, states that it is a residential use of property and specifically said it's not commercial, um, we believe the state can't charge sales tax any longer. So there's, there's quite a few um, factors here that need to be considered. And, and like always, um, you know, we are here to answer questions. If folks have questions, um, feel free to just reach out. We do have uh, three questions that come in, came in for you, Jen. Uh, what are the details and differences in the alternate Senator Horn bill? I think it's also a good time for you to mention the bills that, that we're also supporting. Uh, I think it's uh, HB 5644 and 45. 50, yeah, 5465, oh, 5466. <laughs> Okay. Yep. And there's a couple blogs on those. Um, but the real difference with Senator Horn's bill, the 547, which I did put a link to the, the bill in, in the chat, um, 50 or 547 is not a zoning bill. Again, it is a bill that requires a state registry. It has um, some taxing parity in there. And then it refers to zoning only saying that a community cannot prohibit um, or have rules or regulations that have the effect of prohibiting short-term rentals um, compared to uh, 4722, which is the uh, zoning preemption in the Zoning Enabling Act. That's the one that we're opposed is 4722. Yep, yep. Same with 446, but I mean, Senate Bill 446, I've gotten a lot of questions. Are they gonna move that bill? Um, we don't believe so because that bill would have to be amended. It would have to go over to the House and face a full vote again. And if you remember uh, to try to get 4722 out of the House, we were there until the, you know, two o'clock in the morning. In the morning. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't think the House wants to go through that again. Um, so they, you know, if they change anything to 4722 that's on the Senate, well, it's in the Senate Reg Reform Committee. Um, we have been hearing may be discharged from committee. That is not anything that we have confirmation on, but there is the ability to not have a hearing on it in um, Senate Reg Reform and have it discharged straight to the floor, which if they have the votes, again, they'll do it. Um, so, but yeah, 446, we don't anticipate moving at all um, because it would be, uh, would extend the timeline. It would require the House to have another vote. But if they change 4722 at all, it has to go back to the House for a concurrence vote, which will be easier than a, a vote on a whole new bill of 446. So, okay. so a couple and, questions, more questions for you, Jen. Uh, are, are, the, are the legislators talking to the league and others on this? Are we hearing, are we, are we in conversation? Have we been brought to the table? <laughs> I guess that's two different questions. <laughs> Depends on the legislator. Yeah, <laughs> but exactly. when it comes to specific, um, if you're a legislator or you're hearing um, from someone that there's a compromise, there's new language, um, that is something that the league and other local government groups, as well as the Restaurant and Lodging Association, are not being brought to the table for. Um, and that's why we did introduce uh, 5465 and 5466, is because uh, we wanted to make sure there was an alternative out there that might not be something that we all are like jumping up and down and you know excited about, but it's something we could live with. Um, and it's much better than the, the full preemption. Um, so, I would say no. At this point, when it comes down to those who are the biggest proponents of pushing 4722, whether it's the bill sponsors or it's the group of, um, you know, the, the Michigan Realtors Association, no, we are not being brought to the table to negotiate with them. Yeah. yeah. On that, Matt, I would say just on that, that what, you know, Jen has been incredibly active uh, on this issue and, and our partners in the coalition she's helped form with Restaurant and Lodging and the other groups. Uh, have been meeting, you know, daily with legislators, uh, phone calls, uh, um, you know, after after work meetings, during work meetings. So, you know, this is something that we uh, is probably our number one uh, number one policy issue right now uh, in terms of engagement. We've got some great partners, and and it's been all hands on deck in terms of trying to get people to listen. At this point, as, as folks can imagine. Sides are fairly entrenched, but uh, I, know, I know Jen has a few targets she's uh, she's been working on and continues to work on, and and we need uh, all of our members to stay engaged in this. This is not this is not over yet. 
Yeah. And that's why it's so important that our members reach out to their legislators, because like, it's, we're not asking you to reach out to your legislators because we're not. We are talking to them, but they talk to us all the time. What, what really makes a difference is when they hear from you. Um, that's what makes a difference. I know uh, that's so important. And that's why when we send out emails saying call or, or send a letter to your lawmakers, we really need you to do it because that really makes a difference. Calling is always the preferred method, but we know that uh, you know, some people are a little more shy and rather send out a letter. So we give that option as well. And those, uh, that letter is available on our action center. If you go to mml.org and click on action center, you'll see that letter and you can send out a letter right now. Um, and, uh, we'll put a link to that action center on there as well. And another question, um, can we tightly tweak our rental ordinance? It would still allow short term rentals, but make it challenging for them. Um, I'm guessing they're saying under these under this proposed bill, could they still could they still do that? Well, I, I mean, if they, if they think they can, they I'm sure they probably could. I think you would um, be at the risk of litigation um, because someone would make the argument that while it says it allows it, it it really is making it pretty difficult to actually do it, um, and and therefore you're violating what um, what the bill says. Um, so I would definitely talk to your legal counsel about that, um, you know, to make sure that you're not going to put yourself in the position of, of getting sued. Okay. And what, what was the thinking behind the registry and Senator Horns, Horns bill? What was the reasoning for having a registry? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think, I mean, the reason, the reasoning for a statewide registry is one, um, and that's what 5465 uh, that we um, ha helped get introduced is also a statewide registry. And that is one to know where these are um, and also to help with enforcement. So if you require that the properties and the platforms are registering, um, at least provide some data to municipalities and to the state to see what is really the impact and what's going on. But two, you know, if there's some kind of um, tiering of, you know, this many nights is allowed and is not considered commercial or over, you know, there's a threshold where you cross over into a commercial entity um, where it's not someone's primary residence. They, they don't spend any time or ever actually live there or keep anything there. Um, that the registry will help um, provide some data so you can see how many nights was that rented out and um, make sure that people are paying the taxes that are required. Um, so it's, it's kind of a twofold, one, to know where they're at, and then two, to be able to use as an enforcement um, mechanism if somebody's like, oh, well, I only rented it for a week last year, but that data will show that actually you rented it for three months of the year or something like that. All right. Well, thank you, Jen, uh, so much. I'll let you get back to your other your other meeting. Uh, All right. Me. Thanks. We'll, yeah, we'll turn it over back to Chris. And I do want to bring Harrisana in. We've talked a little bit about the uh, American Rescue Plan um, and uh, like the short term rental issue where we have a coalition. We also have a coalition with the American Rescue and Rescue Plan Act money. Talk to us a little bit about Harrisana and what our members can do to help it and, and be aware of in that in that one. Thanks, Matt. Sure. So MML has been engaged along with, at this point now, I think over 50 partners who are engaged across various industries statewide with constituencies, issue areas to work together to conceptualize a proposal on how the state can spend their $6 billion in ARP, American Rescue Plan money. Um, you know, we've been talking about the American Rescue Plan for months now and, you know, starting with the conversations in D.C., you know, getting those allocations into the hands of local governments, understanding how much those allocations were and what they do. And then subsequently, the state also has a round of funding available to really amplify and leverage the investment that not only we have in our communities, but also for subsequent investments for the future of our state. Uh, and the decision to do something about that right now lies in the hands of our legislature and our governor and getting folks to come together on a plan that is comprehensive, that is inclusive, that can be leveraged across issue areas, and most importantly, is ARP eligible, is a really big priority for our state right now. And so our Coalition for a Strong and Prosperous Michigan has put together a plan, and I will drop the link to that website in the chat so folks can check it out. Um, and you'll also be able to see the diverse groups that we've brought together to help us amplify this message. Um, we have been, since launching our proposal, having conversations with legislators, our executive committee has had some really successful and productive conversations with leadership, both in the Senate and the House. 
letting them know where we are for proposal and getting folks excited around the idea of putting something real on the table. Um, of course, you know, getting folks to take action is really our goal. And so we've been continuing, excuse me, continuing to promote our message. We had a really great op-ed featured in Bridge Magazine that highlighted the voices of DTE, the Home Builders Association, and the laborers on a really powerful message on why it's important for our state to act now, why you know we shouldn't wait for more momentum or more crises to come together to get us to take a move on these dollars, that we have communities that are waiting to see what they want to do. Um, right. But it can really be amplified if we have the support of the state and those investments going in meaningful places. And I think we had a question related to that. Should should I think some of the communities, should we wait on, on deciding how to spend some of our American Rescue Plan Act money until the, the state decides what to do with it? Because I know we've identified there's about $6 billion in ARP money that the state is kind of just trying to figure out what to do with. And our, of course, our comprehensive plan show, gives some suggestions on how to spend that, that six, $6 billion. But what should communities do in the meantime? Yeah. That's a great question, Matt, you know, and I want to also shout out our communities that have done independently a lot of great work to talk to their constituencies, their residents, their community organizations to really see what folks want. Um, a lot of our communities already have a plan of how they want to spend their ARP money. And so what they can do that can be helpful to us, I mean, is very much in line with what Jen was asking. It's, you know, having conversations with their legislators, especially folks who have representatives that are on the appropriations committee or in leading positions in those areas, asking them, you know, what does it take for them to take a move on these ARP dollars that we're ready, we have plans that are ready to go. Um, and the state's always about smart investments, right, and how we can make our dollar go further. And when we have the legislature to actually take action on these investments, our communities can really have an even bigger impact on the things that they're already willing to do. Um, so a big way to make that happen is continuing to amplify the legislators that we cannot wait we're losing out on not only the seasonal ability to get things done, but also the talent and the workforce that's necessary to get projects done on roads, to build more housing so we can attract more talent and have better economic viability. Right. Um, all of those things have to work together and it really starts with making a decision and moving forward while we have the momentum to do so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I did find that specific question. I think it's probably more of a question for Chris regarding the infrastructure package, but I'll ask it. Our city has been planning a millage for improving our water plant. Should we pause and see if we should get are going to get funding from other sources for that? So, like Harrison said, and we've been saying it since day one with the American Rescue Plan, we we think everybody should kind of you know, hit the pause button on spending their ARP dollars to make sure they know what resources are available. There's so many different resources available and more coming. Um, you know, but with a millage question, it's a little different. You've got timing issues you've got to deal with. So, as a community, um, you know. It's an authorization to levy. You certainly, if, if plans change, you know, talk with your uh, talk with your city management, talk to your finance folks and your attorney, figure out kind of what you know what your flexibility is going forward. Know though that there is there is money coming uh, that will be centered around water. How those dollars will flow? Sorry, dad joke. Um, you know, <laughs> will you? Know, that's going to be up in the air a little bit here over the next over the next few weeks. Certainly, the legislature has begun the debate on two and a half billion dollars of American Rescue Plan funds that will go towards water infrastructure and through a number of different programs. We know that this uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has a you know a a lot of money focused on water. So, but how those will be allocated and will they be in the same uh, categories as what your community needs? You're going to have to take a look at that and see but again timing on millages you know you got to be sensitive to that as well that's the other side of the the other side of the coin yeah and i think as a former media person i think one of the things if you're going for a millage of any kind right now you might want to think about one of the questions that your voters are probably going to ask is they're going to say well i heard you're getting all this money from the arp why are you asking us for you know for this millage increase right now? So whatever you decide, you should have also have that question kind of answered, lined up, and ready to go because there could be a perception issue that you don't need it, although you might need it because you might learn that this is what you're going for isn't covered under any of the federal money that you're getting. So that's why you still need to ask for this. Um, a related question: Is there any in the new infrastructure bill? Is there anything for sanitary sewer infrastructure, Chris? You're on mute. Yeah. So, 
and I have to go through the details uh, again. We can say we'll get back to you on that if you want. <laughs> yeah, just in looking at uh, at some of the water language um, based on traditional state revolving funds, Michigan expects to receive 1.3 billion over five years to improve water infrastructure and ensure clean, safe drinking water. Uh, except until we get into some of the details and see see that we I don't have the specifics yet. Um, again, there, there was a lot of conversation about PFAS and contaminants, a lot of conversation around lead and copper, a lot of conversation from American Rescue Plan, water, sewer, and stormwater. So these are broad categories. Certainly American Rescue Plan dollars are eligible for those outside of uh, any COVID impact. These yeah. Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act dollars will also, we believe, be, be similarly focused on those federal programs, regardless of, of any health pandemic impact. So okay. said you got to look at those those existing programs uh, that you might be tapping into tapping into. And <laughs> here we <laughs> go. <Monday. laughs> yeah, right. Oh, what about a related question? Is it safe to spend under the interim rules uh, if the final rules you know are still coming? Might the eligibility change? So let me answer it this way. There's a lot of places that are already appropriating their funds, states and you know other local units that receive their funding directly that are making decisions. Uh, they're making those decisions based upon the interim rules. Will the final guidance change some things? Quite possible. Um, you know, they they took U.S. Treasury took you know pages and pages of of feedback from you know organizations, entities across the country. There will be changes that are made. Um, you know. Certainly, you know, this is a conversation you've got to look at. Are you looking at doing something way outside of the interim guidance? Then you probably got more at risk than if you're if you're falling pretty close within the interim guidance, you're probably going to be fairly similar. Will the eligibility expand? I think that's an option. I think we could see some expansion of eligibility, some changes in the way the US Treasury says to handle calculating things. Uh, we had a lot of questions uh, on the, the calculation of revenue loss. And the way U.S. Treasury talked about uh, your last fiscal year and last calendar year, there there was a lot of feedback that came into U.S. Treasury about needing to recognize the different types of, of fiscal schedules that communities across the country maintain. And so right. you know, there's an expectation that that you know they'll listen to that feedback. So things will change, um, but on the other end of it, people are already the state has already spent some of its ARP dollars. They've already put dollars into schools. I've already put $100 million into uh, community revitalization, place making historic preservation in this current budget. Now, those dollars haven't started going out yet, but you know the, the state is already starting to make some, uh, make some decisions on, on how they want dollars to flow, uh, and local units are as well. Okay. All right. Um, just a couple of quick other issues, Chris. Um, the legislature schedule from here to the end of the year. Um, they're on break right now, uh, coming back after Thanksgiving. I think you said uh, November 30th is when they come back. So what do we expect, uh, you know, once that happens and with different things, issues that we're following? Well, I think, yeah, we'll come back. This is not a, a normal lame duck. Remember, a legislative session is, is two years in length. So this yeah. is the end of the first year. Um, the legislature, though, historically has treated the end of every calendar year as a rush to get stuff done, even though they come right back in the middle of January. So, uh, you know, I think right now we're looking at November 30th through December 16th, those uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of each of those three weeks. Those are the current days that are scheduled uh, for the House and the Senate. Uh, there's an expectation that, as Jen mentioned, the short-term rental issue is still alive and that's the, the time period we'll be operating within um, to see if we can keep that, uh, keep that uh, bottled up in the Senate or you know, get a, a different, uh, different proposal moved, something that we could uh, agree with. Uh, aside from that, you know, the legislature's conversation around American Rescue Plan dollars is likely to be a main focus. There's also some year-end uh, book closing uh, state spending that will need to happen. 
uh, you know, they finished their, their budget uh, right before the October 1st start of the new fiscal year, but there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen with that 900 pages of, of state budget. So we'll see, I, we expect to see a, some sort of supplemental budget bills moving this year uh, before the end of the year, uh, both on the state budget level and on the American Rescue Plan level. Okay. So you know, beyond that, there's a lot of other policy issues. Harrisana, John, Jen, myself are tracking dozens of bills. Uh, you know, any you, our members can keep track of that through our Inside 208 legislative blog. Make yep. sure if you haven't signed up for that, please subscribe, and you'll get email updates every time we post something. Uh, there's yep. a lot That's of right. activity going on right now. And uh, Chris, another kind of issue. It's more of a, a, a national news issue, I guess, and that is regarding the. Uh, the requirement that to have all your employees, if you have more than 100 employees, uh, vaccinated, it required them to get vac the, get the vaccine for COVID. Uh, and that's currently on hold due to a court order stay. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think when, you know, when the president announced uh, his proposal for, you know, any healthcare entity or uh, accepting uh, federal Medicaid or Medicare funds, uh, and then any employer above 100, there was a lot of discussion about what that was going to look like. Uh, when the federal OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health uh, Administration, as soon as they put the rule out there, emergency temporary standard, when they released that a couple weeks ago, um, it was immediately, uh, you know, lawsuit was immediately filed. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals put a stay on that, and, and they've extended that stay right now based upon the, uh, the response and, and uh, from the petitioners and the defendants. So, you know, now we wait for the courts to decide. Certainly, you know, whenever the, the court is finished reviewing this, uh, if it is, if OSHA's uh, emergency standard is upheld, then any employer uh, but with more than 100 employees would be required to have either a testing or a vaccine requirement. It's an either or, a rigorous testing standard or, uh, or vaccine requirement. Uh, you know, it is, our understanding from talking with folks at my OSHA, the Michigan Occupational Safety and Health, uh, that, that they would adopt the federal rule by reference since Michigan is a state plan whenever that is clear. So that would include local governments in Michigan with more than 100 employees at whatever point that may happen. So it's just something we're tracking right now. Uh, again, as, as we go through some of this, uh, the judicial system as this conversation takes place and how that might impact how that court decision might impact local governments in Michigan above a certain size. Certainly the, the whole conversation around employee count is gonna be you know, who, who counts, who's in, who's out. That's gonna be a major issue and require a lot of, a lot of guidance uh, from, the state, uh, from the state and the feds uh, when, when and if we get to that point. All right, well, thank you, Chris, for that. Harrison, I did wanna bring you back into the conversation. It was, I, we kind of cut you off when we brought Jan on to talk about short-term rentals. Was there any other things about the coalition or any of the other work you're doing on that you wanted to cover real, real quick? Yeah, well, I mean, Chris was talking about the upcoming dates and schedule for the legislature moving on. We are anticipating to engage um, our membership as well as other partners in the coalition on November 30th for a lobby day in Lansing. Um, likely our team will be doing most of the direct engagement with legislators because getting meetings can be a little bit more difficult at times, but um, we also are encouraging, you know, our coalition members and also our members to, to schedule meetings and to talk to legislators. We actually will be putting together some materials for our members to make that a lot easier, such as action alerts that you may have seen with short-term rentals, but you know, emails that you can send, some topics, that, talking points that can help you in phone conversation, but really honing in on that November 30th day of re-emphasizing how important it is for the legislature to take the opportunity to act on ARP dollars, to make a decision and not push this into the new year or to when maybe there is a greater crisis or you know the interest of doing it around elections. Like we have these dollars in hand right now to do something transformational. And like we were talking about earlier, our communities are waiting to see what's gonna happen at the state and further on to make sure that their dollars have the maximum impact. Um, so we'll be really honing in on that message on the 30th, reiterating everything that we have shared with legislators today with our press conference, with the content we've been pushing in the media, as well as conversations that we've been having independently. So we'll be sharing more information about that soon and looking forward to keeping our folks engaged. All right. Well, good. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead, Chris. Do you have something else? Yeah, just on it. Harrison is absolutely right. I mean, the, the timing of, of the legislature starting to act on these dollars is so important. Remember, the state received its allocation in May of this year. Uh, the second allocation, the second tranche of funds will come in, you know, in 
in six months now, uh, less than six months now, the state will receive its second allocation. So getting these dollars out the door, uh, or at least at least giving local governments and the public some understanding of where the state's priorities are will, will only help us, one, in, in our competition against other states, as they're already moving forward with their allocation and appropriation of their funds, and just lining up, lining up contractors for construction season. Uh, you know, the, the more we wait to know how, how, what the priorities are for the spending, the more that other states can jump ahead and secure those contractors uh, for doing work in those states and, and the further behind we fall. And there is a time frame. I mean, we have time to spend these dollars. We've got until 2026 to expend them, but, but that time starts to, to, to run out really quickly. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, and really interesting stuff. I appreciate it, uh, everything. A uh, couple of things I do want to mention. Uh, we do have a lot of different events coming up uh, later this week is the uh, Michigan Mayor's uh, Educational Institute in Mount Pleasant. Uh, you can go to our website, mml.org, and go to our event calendar to find that and all the other events we have coming up. Uh, we have a, a Michigan Green Communities webinar on November 30th. Uh, to Harrison, I mentioned the lobbying day. You'll see, get more information on that. Our next Live with the League is Monday, November 29th, right after Thanksgiving. Hopefully, we won't be too uh, stuffed from Turkey. We'll have that. And then we have a series of newly elected officials training. So we know a lot of councils had turnover and it's some new, new faces and people. Uh, so we have a series of trainings for them, also for seasoned officials. It's, good, it's a good refresher course if you're already on your council, but it's a good, uh, a good uh, session to take if, if you're brand new and you need to learn the ropes. Uh, we have a bunch of different options. We have um, some in-person options on December 1st in our Lansing office and January 22nd in our um, Ann Arbor office. And then we have two virtual options. So you have to leave, leave the comfort of your own home. And that is on December 9th, Thursday and Saturday, just January 15th. Again, you can find all those dates on our event calendar. And then we'll have a, a, another a set of trainings in February for advance and uh, a new new uh, elected officials. So a lot of trainings coming up, a lot of different things that you'll be hearing from us. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Harisana and Jen and Betsy and Kristen working on the, making me look good here uh, by helping me behind the scenes. So I appreciate everybody and, and thank you very much. Till next time, November 29th, we'll see you on Live with the League.